brief journey of the origins of Part L. Well, we can see uh, 1984 was uh, sort of the start where uh, heating systems and insulation services was more of a sort of a, a way of a design guide, a, a sort of some way to benchmark it, guidance on how to do that. Um, revised again, and this is the major one, I suppose, really, uh, in 1995, and bringing in the thought, the idea of conservation of fuel and power, which we all know. Uh, 2002, that's where the format of the regulations start becoming something that we recognise today, split with dwellings and non-dwellings. Three methods of uh, compliance, the elemental, looking at everything separately and in their own right, whole building method and uh, the carbon emissions uh, calculation method. SAP was introduced as well, uh, the beginnings of that is the compliance tool. Uh, 2006, and that's really setting the scene now, so that's uh, looking at the new build and the existing buildings, and that format now is what we're, we now recognise uh, today. Uh, SBIM, uh, everyone's uh, favourite there, that's, that made its introduction there. And uh, it's starting to look at the idea of comparing with the target emission rate, so uh, your building or dwelling emission rates against this TER. And then clearly this is when we start seeing improved values for the new values, etc., for plant efficiencies, uh, you know, that kind of stuff, all that good stuff. Um, EPCs, now, EPCs, as we all know, uh, we're very used to today, uh, but uh, that was the way stated in the EPBD, the European Performance Buildings Directive. You know, we've got to be able to communicate how our buildings are performance and, uh, and, 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 and relate that back to some benchmarks. Those articles there that we can see is, uh, set out the guidelines for that. Um, first introduced in 2008, both for dwellings and non-dwellings in that year. And uh, taking that very brief journey, now bang up to date, we're now well into uh, Part L 2010. And, uh, and obviously just as we're getting used to those designs and finding our way around it, uh, 2013 is uh, just around the corner. So where are we now? Part L 2010, I'm sure most of you will uh, uh, know this pretty much inside out by now. Uh, the biggest change in Criterion 1, Criterion 1 and Criterion 3 really are the two biggest changes, I think, uh, to take note from uh, uh, in 2010. Target emission rate, using the, uh, the notional, so no longer are we um, taking into account of other factors within the notional, it's a straight, uh, straightforward uh, design benchmark in the notional, and it's allowing us then to be able to compare our actual buildings against uh, the notional building and uh, being able to see if we're meeting that criteria and, and certain elements, and if we're not meeting it, then we know that we'll have to make it up elsewhere. So that's helping us, I think, in the design compared to uh, previously there. Um, Aggregately, uh, it's designed to uh, achieve uh, a reduction of about 25%, although, uh, as we know as designers, uh, that does vary depending on the actual building type uh, of what it is, retail maybe being one of the, the, the hardest ones. Uh, uh, it's maybe more stringent, bigger savings there to be made. Um, criterion 2, um, typically the same as t the 2006 regulations. Um, uh, again, it's all about uh, you know, look, uh, communicating sort of the benchmarks to start from, but uh, it's allowing us as designers to work out really where we want to improve and give us uh, the freedom in our designs to maybe relax on one element of the design and, and make up in other elements. Uh, criterion 3, that was, a, that was a big change. So instead of... Uh, uh, sort of the, the, the three um, methods of uh, compliance for that, it was now reduced down to one. Uh, so again, benchmark, so we must, uh, must not exceed that. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's a bit more complex than that. We must bear in mind as designers, really, that uh, uh, we've got to investigate fully the effects of uh, summer overheating, etc., within that building. So, uh, but it makes it a little bit easier, but it comes with the the negative side that we need to, can't forget about the, the real importance of what's going on there. Uh, the target emission rate is now the uh, notional building emission rate. Again, that's going back to the criterion one there. What I'm saying is it's a lot easier and it's allowing us, that's going back to uh, 2002, I think, effectively, that, that side. So 2006, we changed it. We tried to stick into these other factors, improvement factors and low zero carbon factors, but that really wasn't helping us as designers. So that's um, uh, a, a massive in improvement. Uh, the other uh, um, uh, thing to really note and stress maybe at this point uh, and, and emphasise is the National Calculation Method uh, Modelling Guide and that's uh, really been overhauled uh, thoroughly and so I'm sure most of you will have uh, read through that in some, some detail um, 
over the past uh, year or two, but it's, if you haven't, then it's, it's definitely worth um, uh, uh, doing so. Uh, being the guide, actually being the guide that we do to develop these tools that you are now using. Okay, just as a, a quick summary of, uh, uh, of just what we've talked about there. 25% improvement aggregate over 2006. Uh, of course, depending on uh, the building types that you're doing, uh, can, can be some, in some cases exceeding 30%. Like I said, retail was one example. Uh, healthcare being um, uh, maybe one of the easier ones. Uh, SBIM uh, improved and changed. Criterion 3, again, that's been simplified, but because it's been simplified in some ways, uh, we need to be very careful that we're uh, keeping our eye on uh, the overheating, uh, the compliance is onerous. Thermal bridging constraints, uh, compliance, we're needing to do compliance much, much, much earlier on now. Okay, so we're doing much more work. So the idea of the old rebuild work stages um, is really becoming um, uh, sort of, a, well, a little bit of history there, really. You know, we're doing uh, stage E work at stage C and we're bringing it much more forward and as we move into uh, the world of building information modelling that's all uh, changing quite rapidly so uh, compliance has to be done much earlier on. 25% uh, I think generally across the 25% against 2006 uh, uh, part L I think uh, it has proved very challenging. Um, I think the idea was when, when it was brought out everyone would say well it can be achieved without renewables but we are using renewables to try and get us across that line in many cases. Um, which is going to prove quite challenging moving forward to part of 2013, which we'll talk about later on, is um, well, if we're exhausting our sort of safety net of renewables to help with our designs, uh, where, where are we going to go from here? How are we going to do that? We're really going to have to start focusing on um, at our passive measures, our, our core design of that building, and making those uh, really... Uh, force a lot um, greater integration of the design team at the earliest, earliest stages. And I think we're starting to see that now. And I think with uh, building information modelling, you know, this, uh, that, that's the sort of vehicle that's kind of helped us drive this. So um, while it's been, always been a sort of great idea for this integrated approach, I think 2010 has really been a, a bit of a driver, a push uh, to force that in. So we're seeing um, engineers being brought in by architects much earlier on than they would do. Uh, we're seeing architects from our own perspective taking on uh, energy analysis and all kinds of analysis with the virtual environment themselves. And we're seeing this um, communication with MIT files flowing across design teams. So that's quite good from our point of view. It's quite an interesting seeing as an overview how that's all developing. Um, in 2013, just around the corner, 2016 doesn't seem that far off now, does it really? Uh, zero carbon homes by 2016 in schools um, and really all buildings, all new buildings uh, by 2019, 2019 uh, apparently will be zero carbon uh, by that time. Okay, well it wouldn't be uh, an IES presentation without some sort of uh, uh, mention about it, but obviously we, we do all this accreditation, um, so accreditation at IES.com, get in touch with us and we can do that, so uh, that's no problem at all, as, as you well know. And with all these new developing uh, regulations and things, there'll be uh, uh, respective top-ups with that, so feel free if you're a bit unsure exactly where you stand with that, if you need top-up training or uh, you're not too sure where your accreditation stands, then uh, get in touch with us and we're quite happy to speak, uh, as we always are. Uh, with you and guide you through that process. Right, so what's coming in the future? Well, as uh, Grant Shapps keeps talking about, from 2016, uh, all new dwellings will be uh, zero carbon, and by 2019, uh, all the rest of the buildings and new buildings will follow. So what does zero carbon mean? Um, I pulled this off the Zero Carbon Hub uh, website last week. And um, I think there's still, it's still very interesting that when we talk about zero carbon, we think of, uh, well, literally zero carbon, but that's not the case. Um, uh, so it would be very tough, but uh, effectively we're looking back at the old, um, was it lean, green, etc., clean uh, rule here. So we're looking at passive measures, really exhausting all our options on that in every building. And then moving up to 70% carbon compliance using on site uh, renewable generation. But we know, and it's beyond unreasonable of us to ask that purely on those uh, alone that we would, we would get net zero carbon. 
And so we're going to make the rest of that. And the definition here is uh, zero carbon would be uh, exhausting passive measures, 70% carbon compliance with your uh, on-site generation, like PVs, etc., and then making up the rest from allowable uh, measures. And those allowable measures are uh, slightly undefined, actually, but uh, generally it's meaning uh, power stations, so cleaner uh, grid electricity, etc., that's going to help us bring down uh, the overall um, carbon emissions associated with that building. Okay, it's quite a useful thing there. Okay, so my, my main context that I'm going to touch on really uh, is, is the Green Deal. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about that just now. Uh, the consultation process um, has uh, begun and finished, uh, and we're waiting on a response back for that, and we expect to hear that uh, in the coming months. Uh, what is the Green Deal? Well, the Green Deal is uh, effectively a financial mechanism, so it's allowing um, dwellings and non-dwellings the opportunity to uh, have energy efficiency measures, bringing down uh, the energy uh, consumption uh, within, within those buildings and the associated carbon emissions uh, without having to outlay the capital expenditure needed for those and you pay that back over time. And that's the sort of principle behind it and you do that uh, through um, reduced energy bills. Uh, the reduction that you do in that uh, is what you would pay back to your energy supplier to uh, basically pay up that capital expenditure that you did on that building. And I'll go into that in a wee bit uh, more detail later on. Um, uh, there will be uh, sort of subsidy support for poorer households and dwellings and certain installations where um, uh, technologies maybe don't quite pay for themselves. We'll talk about that a bit later on. Um, and uh, the Green Deal, as it stands at the moment, uh, for dwellings will be launched in uh, October this year and non-dwellings uh, sometime after that. Although, um, while we're told stringently that that uh, is sort of set in stone in October, uh, there's a lot of calls within the industry for various reasons, which we'll, again we'll talk about, um, for maybe pushing back on that and maybe see, uh, going through the consultation process again and, and just delaying it by sort of six months or so. so but at the moment, uh, we're told uh, very firmly that October for uh, dwellings and, and, uh, and after that sometime uh, for non-dwellings. Okay, so this is just a bit of structure here. I don't really want to labour this point too much, uh, but it just helps to visualise and put in context what we'll be talking about over the next couple of slides. So, uh, DEC overseeing absolutely everything. Um, and there will be various governmental bodies that are uh, created to, to implement this. But actually, uh, the government's hoping to do this uh, fairly uh, inexpensively uh, and hoping that the private sector is actually going to drive most of this. Um, they're expecting, uh, in the, I think in the, the first couple of years, something like £14 billion pounds of private sector in, uh, investment in, in all of this from the various aspects and so they see the private sector really being the ones that are going to grow this, which is right down at the bottom there. But it's uh, just quite interesting to see what else is going to be happening. Okay. Uh, just to put, um, give you a quite a clear idea of how the Green Deal process uh, is, uh, how it's going to work and what the various mechanisms are. I know some of you will have seen this, but uh, it's quite good just to make it quite clear. Um, the, first th the first step, the first stage of it will be um, from the consumer up. Okay, so it'll be remote advice. This will be uh, effectively accessing a publicly funded uh, body uh, where uh, they'll be able to get impartial advice uh, via the telephone, internet, whatever, uh, fax machine if you've got one, where um, you'll be able to po point you through the various steps, how, how the Green Deal process will work, and maybe where this, your first uh, step or two uh, point in the right direction of that. I suppose um, in my head I sort of uh, maybe relate it back to like the MCS scheme if you were looking to put some uh, photovoltaics on the roof, that kind of stuff. You, you can touch there first, you can see uh, who the suppliers are, wh who the providers are, and, and, and get a direction from there. Um, okay, so at this point, the consumer, uh, whether it be business or a private individual in their house, they'll be able to go here and understand what the process is and be put in the right direction. And one of the things that they'll be put in front of is the first step will be the energy assessor. Whether it's a domestic or non-domestic energy assessor, they'll be able to go to an approved list uh, of them. Now, uh, we have already accredited energy assessors in both uh, dwellings and non-dwellings, but uh, obviously there's, there's quite a, uh, a shift change in, in what they'll be doing, and so there is a, a training to be done this uh, just now, and there is uh, 
apparently quite a lot of people undergoing training and signing up just now for this. Um, so you, you'll get an impartial person, independent uh, person in uh, energy assessors to come in, they'll do a site visit, they'll come around, they'll do all the things that we understand the energy assessors to do, looking at the fabric and looking at uh, various mechanical services, etc. And also understanding other aspects which uh, maybe there hasn't been incorporated before, such as occupancy patterns and how the buildings are actually used. Um, so that's quite a key point, actually, uh, to think about there. And they'll write up uh, their recommendations for it, they'll do their assessment, they'll use their uh, SAP, uh, reduced SAP, which is uh, undergoing a big, big change at the moment, and S or SBIM if it's uh, a non-dwelling, uh, effectively give you an EPC rating, and uh, on that EPC will be a number of measures that they have uh, prioritised for, for that building. And we'll, we'll, we'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. Uh, from there, then we um, uh, have to get in touch with what's known as the, the Green Deal Provider. Uh, the Green Deal Provider is effectively a financial body, if you like, at its core. Um, they then take the report from the independent assessor um, at the EPC, then look at financially, OK, how much is this going to cost? What are the top three recommendations from the assessor? Putting a price tag against it, putting against a plan for it. Um, so they will then uh, communicate directly with you as the... Uh, 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 you know, as the uh, consultant maybe for the for, for the office for the for the client, and uh, you you will start talking through the various financial uh, aspects of it. <coughs> they will then also uh, it's quite a key point. They will then put you in uh, contact with um, the installer of the measures that uh, you've decided to go with, um, and these are all be accredited green deal marked. Um, uh, individual companies, and they may be a subsidiary of the financial company. It might, this might all be done within the one Green Deal provider. We certainly see maybe subsidiaries of the likes of utilities uh, maybe uh, doing this and developing this, um, or it might be separate. So, uh, but they effectively that is all looked after by the Green Deal provider and yourselves. They will be industry recognised, and they will do the work for you and sign it off. And then from there, uh, uh, we go to the repayments. Now the payments. Uh, are, will be done through the energy bills of your business with the utilities and then the utilities will then um, pay back the money to the Green Deal provider so it's that kind of loop there and that's how it all works and it's very key point is that the, the reason that it's done uh, through the energy bills is because the, uh, the debt effectively or the, the deal that you have done there for that, that loan if you like uh, sticks with the energy meter, the business, the property uh, not, not the business or the, or the individual um, so that, that you know, that's that's quite a key point there. We'll maybe talk about that a little bit uh, on. Yeah, and another good point as well, and the reason uh, is that you, uh, as businesses, will constantly be changing your energy deals. You know, maybe every two years to get the best rate, um, and so you can't be tied in uh, for maybe a ten-year or twenty-year. Uh, financial commitment to one energy supplier. So you do have the freedom to move between utilities and that's why you've got the deal with the, the Green Deal provider. Um, so you're, you do have that freedom. Although there are uh, certain aspects with that. Certain utility companies will be uh, excluded from, uh, from, from being able to uh, provide you with fuel uh, due to uh, uh, basically not having the financial backing themselves. I'll, 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 I'll explain a bit more detail in a bit. Okay, um, so I've been sort of hinting about the golden rule. Uh, the golden rule uh, is the whole concept behind how this repayment works. Okay, so the government's very keen for us all to become much more energy efficient, um, but realise that uh, we're all struggling, uh, maybe with capital expenditure. It's not as easy to come by as, as it has done uh, previously. Um, so the idea is that you pay up over time. So we can see here. So if your energy bill here was um, eight hundred pounds uh, per year. Uh, then after the energy efficiency measures that you have uh, employed in that building, uh, it would drop down to 430, and then that gives you this um, uh, 370-pound saving. And uh, the, golden, the golden rule here is that it's a net saving overall, even after the measures. So if we say, for example, then that gives you 340 pounds that you can spend annually paying back against the capital expenditure that you have. So overall, the idea is that you see, um, you see a distinct uh, saving in your energy use, but also financially as well. And we'll talk about that. That's, uh, I think there's quite some strong opinions about that within the industry. OK. OK, the golden rule uh, will be calculated using uh, effectively based on the EPC that is done by the uh, independent uh, energy assessor. 
and uh, and in that EPC, the EPC has actually changed, and we'll talk about that later on. Uh, where on the EPC, it's not just a case of giving you a rating, and that's pretty much it. You'll be, there will be identified areas where uh, the building is performing uh, weekly, and where uh, those improvements maybe should should, uh, should be made, and where the money should be spent. Um, and so it should give a good overall indication of, uh, of what's going on with that building. Uh, here's just a, a quite an important note. So uh, reduce SAP, uh, as we know, is the uh, so compliance tool really uh, historically uh, for existing buildings, and but that's being overhauled uh, by BRE. Sure, as with uh, SBM and uh, it's undergoing testing at the moment, as I understand it. Orientation and exposure being uh, covered in there. Yeah, you're able to split uh, the building, not just doing it as a whole building, but able to look at it room by room, so you're able to understand and work at areas of uh, problematic uh, areas. Um, it's going to include a whole range of new energy efficiency measures that just weren't simply available at that time. Um, and we'll have a look at those as well later on. There's going to be an indication the Golden Rule's basically been uh, uh, brought into it. But, um, and, and here's just a kind of uh, from the new EPC format, uh, and I should just point out that I've, the EPC format that I've got here is a domestic one, but I'm just using this as a kind of likely indication of what the, the non-domestic one will look like. I, I don't see uh, why they would uh, differentiate too much you know, in the formats. But here you can see quite clearly on the right-hand side, for example, that you know, you've got these different measures that have been recommended on the right-hand side. You're um, uh, quite clearly displaying which ones are going to pay back and those that uh, aren't. Uh, although, looking at the bottom there, a second one up, looking at the internal and external wall insulation, um, I'm not sure how spending 14000 on an upgrade and paying back a saving of £44 per year, how that gets a green tick. So I thought maybe there is a few issues with it uh, as it stands at the moment, but, uh, and it doesn't help maybe with the confidence of the industry at the moment, but we can talk about that later. Um, clearly, uh, will mostly be involved, I think, here in this room with uh, non-domestic non buildings. And uh, SBIM, SBIM's having quite a, a, an overhaul at the moment. It's been, I've been speaking to um, a couple of people who are testing it at the moment, and they, it is, it is uh, quite some market changes. A lot of these things um, actually are similar to uh, almost the points that we had that we went through there with, uh, with the uh, reduced SAP. Um, basically, Almost change. They're trying to change a compliance tool into an energy prediction tool, and um, uh, that, that's really the essence of what they're trying to do here. So I mean, you can uh, we'll, we'll maybe raise those points towards the end. Um, just some key notes as well. I just want to point this out just so that we're clear about this. So the energy companies aren't the ones that you're doing the, the green deal with. It's the green deal providers. Just a, um, I keep speaking to people about this, and they they kind of get a bit fuzzy about it, but it is. Um, but it's the green. But, the, but you pay the energy provider, but that money makes its way back down to the, the green deal providers. Uh, I said previously that uh, some energy utility companies will be excluded from uh, from the green deal process, so you will be having a more limiting choice. Oh, clearly, the, big, the the standard big ones that uh, you'll be dealing with uh, uh, will be fine. But um, any, any sort of um, ones with uh, they're saying at the moment the benchmark is two hundred fifty thousand customers then. Uh, they're not going to do that, and uh, presumably that's through some sort of financial um, safety net um, reasoning behind that. Um, payments are passed to the Green Deal provider within 72 hours, um, and the ability to switch is the key one. don't think you're getting uh, trapped into just one. I think that's, that's the main point, really, from this. Installers... Uh, the installers who will uh, come and size up the job, under, under, uh, undertake the job and, and, and mark it off, they're all going to be fully accredited. Uh, there's very, uh, various like, uh, vocational courses and all the kind of standard uh, UCAS uh, certified uh, things going on. Um, so that should work well. Uh, there's a code of practice, a uh, Green Deal code of practice, which is probably worth actually uh, flicking through at some point. Um, and that's what everyone signs up to. So whether you're an installer or a provider or whatever, uh, you'll, you, you'll have to sign up to that um, in your own respective ones. Um, you could, uh, you have the choice, once you're dealing with your Green Deal providers, to choose the ones that they're recommend they, uh, recommending, or uh, you, indeed you can actually say that you prefer one over another for whatever uh, reason that would be. And there is, um, uh, and there is, it is all governed 
Uh, typically, this thing is a safety net. Uh, it's, you know, there's, there's a hierarchy there. It's, it's governed uh, by various bodies as well. Uh, the Green Deal providers. I think the Green Deal providers is really the main point here. And uh, uh, so we sort of talked about that. that they're the ones that you're going to be doing the financial deal with and setting it up. Um, there is no clear direction, actually, in terms of the Green Deal, in terms of how long, what is the payback period. Normally, in the industry that we work in, when we're dealing with our clients, uh, we would only really be talking of maybe payback periods of between three to five years, or maybe even up to seven years, but nothing much longer than that. Um, there is a bit of indication there that um, has been talking about it could be 10 years or 25 years, so that's the kind of... Uh, level that we could be to, to, to incorporate some of these technologies. And that's, 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 that's quite a, uh, it's quite, quite a long time to have any sort of burden of, of effectively debt against the building, I suppose. Um, so uh, doing this, uh, warranties, um, and I think the most important thing in this slide uh, towards the end actually is the, uh, the aspect of the complaints procedure. So the people that you're going to, uh, the Green Deal provider, and the ones that are setting up the deal and recommending which ones you go for and doing all this, are actually the same people that you'll be um, going to to complain about it. So if you do end up with the scenario, which might happen, possibly, is that uh, maybe you don't see any energy savings uh, once the uh, measures have been installed in, on, the, on, on, the, uh, on the building in your office, whatever, um, but you still have to pay back that capital expenditure that's gone in, so you might end up paying more and who do you go to? You're going back to the people that have actually recommended the, that in the first place. So I don't know if that is such a great feedback loop, but we can talk about that later on. OK, approved measures. Now, consultation-wise, uh, there's a huge list. I think there's about 40 different identified uh, measures that you can put into a building, which is quite surprising and, and very different to uh, the sort of drop-down menus that you have in your SBEM at the moment. Um, so this is just giving you a flavour of what's going on and sort of passive measures or what I've called the passive measures, things ranging from your insulation, various types of insulation. Um, I don't know if actually I was looking for blown beads. I was at, I was at a conference, um, a sort of informal conference uh, last week where uh, uh, there was somebody up in Edinburgh who had gone through uh, testing some of the uh, RD SAPs and the, the new SBIM, and they were looking at different energy efficiency measures. And the one thing that they uh, had said was um, that the best savings in terms of um, payback and all the rest of it was actually the hot water cylinder insulation jacket out of everything, um, which is, uh, seems a bit, uh, you know, could do better maybe. But um, capital wall insulation, and, oh, and the key point was blown bead insulation. He reckoned that was one of the best things, but that's not actually one that's going to be eligible at this stage. Um, and the expectation is that these measures will reduce quite dramatically, actually, by the time it, uh, it comes out in the guidance, um, judging by what's been happening in the, in the consultation. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we've got these uh, effects, effects of thermostats and insulations, etc. We've got all the typical kind of air source heat pumps being at the top there. Uh, biomass boilers and ground source heat pumps, solar water heating, uh, CHP. I think we'd expect to see all these, nothing too uh, dramatic. And other things, uh, fuel mechanical heat recovery and uh, all that kind of stuff. So there's quite a lot of choice in there. It would be very interesting, I think, to see what makes it through to the eligible list. And then, um, then the real work will be actually identifying which ones will actually work uh, within the buildings that we're working on, I suppose. Maybe not as many as... Uh, it might be stated there. Uh, other very quick details. Uh, the EPC is very important, so when you're, uh, if your client's selling their building and moving on, then it needs to be fully disclosed. I think we'd expect that. You just won't be um, buying a property or moving into a, a rental uh, commercial space uh, without uh, referring to the EPC and what Green Deal has got with that. I mean, from a personal point of view as well, I think if you uh, were thinking back to your own house, actually, you know, you, I think there is maybe that concern of um, how you see the Green Deal. Is the Green Deal going to improve uh, the ability to sell that house? And, and, and thinking as well about commercial property, but uh, is it going to improve it or do you think it's going to be a negative aspect? Do you think people are, see it as a debt really against that building? Uh, so all this is going to bring EPCs right up at the front. I think EPCs have been something that have been around with us for some time, but. Uh, really, we haven't taken too much notice. Every day in this room, we all, we all get it and we, we, we have an interest in it. 
but I think Joe Clogs out in the street doesn't really, uh, not too bothered, not really sure what an A rating actually is. Um, and tenants as well, this is uh, to do with dwellings I suppose, but actually tenants can uh, be effectively activate a Green Deal uh, agreement uh, as long as the landlord is involved as well. Uh, ultimately though it's the bill pair that um, will, uh, uh, is responsible for paying that Green Deal. Okay, just so that's that's really the context of the Green Deal, and some of us will have seen that maybe once or twice uh, before. But um, our take on it, well, uh, yes, it's to be launched in October 2012. We do wonder uh, ourselves that maybe that is too soon. We think we feel as though it's been like, there's a great deal of momentum behind this, and maybe it's been sort of rushed through, um, and uh, maybe the idea of uh, delaying it by six months um, might help the process. Um, I know, particularly if you're talking about the 14 billion that's expected to be pumped into it by the private sector, that's a hell of a lot of money to um, uh, just to spend without thoroughly going through it. Um, uh, and non-domestic, whenever that's going to be launched, we expect it's going to be around about this time next year. Um, one of our greatest uh, uh, concerns or points to note really is actually. Um, uh, with the uh, reduced SAP and the SBIM, um, we very much see that as uh, you know is a compliance tool, and we're trying to take a compliance tool and change it into something that it's not, and make it into an energy prediction tool. You know, and we use SBIM all the time. Uh, most of you will do here, and um, you know we never take the energy side from it. We never really um, sign off on you know that is what is actually going to happen in that building. It just can't. So there's not enough control over the, the various variables in that uh, to give you that output and um, you know that's that's uh, so we've got a bit of concerns about that can you really evolve something into something it's not and and make it as accurate as that so we we would um, uh, maybe raise well you know what else is out in the market today we, we use dynamic simulation uh, DSM and uh, you know why don't we use that? It's just it seems uh, that would be the obvious choice to me. And maybe if I was a designer in, in your shoes and looking at buildings and being involved in this process, um, well, I would have to use uh, SBM, the new SBM, to produce my EPCs, etc. Um, I would maybe be looking at uh, well, do my own calculations uh, in, in DSM, maybe knowing that I'm able to go into greater de detail and depth of detail, maybe get a more accurate answer, and just maybe protect my own company and my own. Uh, reasoning with, with the various uh, energy predictions that are going to come out. So, uh, I, uh, that's a sort of main point really from from from, from this uh, Green Deal episode. Um, the energy efficiency measures. Um, that's very interesting. Again, I was just saying there's a whole heap there, and it looks very promising. The idea of to have this free range of all these uh, different measures and, and be able to employ them in my uh, effectively my refurbishment program. But um, we do think that that will typically just be uh, what will dry down, and um, and the ones that actually give you the payback within any reasonable concern. You know, I mean, is is your client who's going to spend uh, a million pounds on uh, it would sign up to maybe a million pound green deal on their uh, commercial premises? You know, they're going to take you seriously when you say, well, this is going to last for 25 years. I think you're going to have to be a very good, uh, convincing argument really to make that happen. Um, we definitely see this as favouring. Uh, non-domestic properties. Um, not sure about the domestic side. I think uh, people, um, when you look into into some depth, and uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure if um, with all these different steps and this sort of chain command of this process, with that there is administration charges and there are profitability issues as well with that. Then, as you as a consumer, if you're going to take on a ten grand debt on your own home, uh, maybe you'd rather just. Uh, somehow find five grand yourself and do the work yourself and save, save the money and the, the, the needless admin and profitability on that side. But commercial wise, it makes sense. Banks are not giving up the money they be they used to. Finding that capex can, can be struggling. Don't want to use up our cash as it, as it was. Um, so effectively, it's, a, you know, it's, it's a more of a, uh, maybe a complicated loan, but that's really what it is. And so commercial wise, we do see, see this happening. Um, various other, other aspects to it as well, as well. Um, the Green Deal assessors, uh, who's really looking after them. Um, uh, this is referring back to that uh, structure program, that uh, uh, command structure that we had at the start. There's various government bodies coming in and saying that we'll regulate everything. Well, we've kind of heard that before, and uh, regulations uh, can sometimes be a bit aloof. Um, so, um, you know, as an independent assessor comes along, 
uh, there might be a small temptation there to uh, inflate the predicted savings. Um, I don't know. But again, it's down to integrity, I suppose. Uh, and ultimately, I think it's just about what protects us. And, uh, and this, is, this is going back to the DSM idea, is that we, uh, no matter who we are, really, we want uh, the best, not just to protect ourselves, but to protect the, the project. And we do want to see the real savings materialising. So if, they're, you know, if it is only a 5% saving and we base a calculation on that, that's fine. Uh, it's, um, you know, it's just all about doing, uh, getting as accurate results as possible. And... Uh, yeah, another concern is, as we feel that there's such a great deal of uh, momentum with, uh, with pushing this through, uh, we are worried that actually those that will be accredited and uh, to do this, uh, maybe the numbers just won't be there. And if they are there, then how many jobs have they done before they come and see you? That kind of thing, that, those kind of worries. OK, just to very quickly go through the EPC side. Um, this kind of tail off in the, in the Green Deal aspect there. Uh, now the EPCs have gone through quite an overhaul, so they haven't changed since, uh, what was it, 2007, I think, when they first came out, 2008. Um, but um, uh, there's, there's some major changes, and effectively this is uh, as a dropout uh, due to the, the Green Deal uh, that's, that's coming in. And a lot of these things are... Uh, uh, actually, if you look at anything that's changing at the moment, uh, you'll tend to find somewhere uh, buried in the middle of it will be a reference to the Green Deal. So it's activating a lot of this, and this is why we're talking about it today. Um, big change, EPCs will become publicly avail uh, available. Uh, so anyone, anywhere, uh, will be able to, as an individual, go and just check up on an EPC of a particular building. Um, so as designers, and we were doing these calculations in the past that we've been doing for five odd years plus, uh, with not, maybe not three, four years, um, those EPCs that we've been doing on various uh, projects, uh, we'll start getting the dust shaken off them and people start looking at them and uh, reviewing them. Um, also, uh, there will be bulk, um, bulk users such as uh, public sector bodies that will be uh, uh, doing them. And effectively, the reason for them being made public, actually, uh, actually if we go down to the, the last point there, is uh, Green Deal providers, because they're going to be coming, phoning you up, saying... Um, OK, you've got this, uh, you know, 1,000 square metre building, commercial property, you've got, an, you've got a, a, a G rating. Um, let's talk, let's get someone in and let's sell you some stuff. Current EPC, this is one. This is, uh, it is a domestic one. I haven't seen the non-domestic one, but again, it's just given us a flavour of what's going to come out in, in, the, uh, in the coming time. This is the, the original SAP. So, so again, so we all see the, uh, it's clearly uh, identified by the, uh, a to G uh, rating graph there, uh, with some uh, measures at the bottom and, and, and sort of breaking down the energy use within that building into various components. Um, but during uh, uh, the government bodies sort of looked into it and research showing that actually uh, um, the majority of people just uh, are not, not particularly interested in it. They have it, they file it away somewhere and they forget about it. Um, so really we need to uh, change that, or they've identified that they need to change that. Uh, reasons include, you know, Language is too technical, too lengthy, confusion over ratings, what does it actually mean? Uh, large amounts of text, uh, which is interesting actually because the new EPC has got a lot bigger, so there's more text than that, but this is what they said. And uh, so it's gone through a, a major redesign, um, make it much clearer. Um, the technical aspect, uh, technical language has been broken down into layman terms, which is good. Uh, and um, it's very clear emphasis on the financial costs and, uh, and, uh, and various measures. And obviously, again, that's because of the Green Deal, right? And that's what, that's what we've got down there. And so this is, this is kind of this is what the domestic one looks like, but we expect the non-domestic one to look very similar to it. So again, similar in the, the first aspect, there's actually four slides to make up the length of this EPC. That's what I was meaning by more text. But um, uh, you can quickly see uh, the elements that have been transposed from the original EPC. Uh, on there, so you've got some broken down energy usage and you've got your, 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 your A to G graph, etc. And then we can start going down here. This is when the Green Deal starts getting, getting introduced, when you've got your top actions, you know, your top three uh, that you should explore that have been recommended from the assessor uh, to improve your building. Uh, again, here, and we start looking at look, elemental. So we start looking at uh, uh, the elements within the building and, and rating them in a very simple sort of uh, five star rating. So it should uh, you know, without really understanding all oh, the differences between EPC ratings and whatever, maybe uh, ultimately everybody understands what five star means and what one star means. That's quite transposable. Uh, LZCs are included here, and uh, obviously a bit more about the Green Deal in the process that we've just gone through there. And again, 
uh, going back into more measures and being able to really what that measure will uh, directly impact on or predicted to impact on uh, your energy rating uh, overall. And again, we expect this to be very similar to uh, what the uh, non-domestic uh, EPC will look like when that comes out.